So, augmented reality. Um, two basic things to um, cover today. Uh, the first one is the project that we worked on. Uh, so HART, which stands for Heritage Education Augmented Reality Tours, HART for short. Um, and the second is just a general overview of augmented reality um, itself. So we'll just crack straight in. Lots of information, so please uh, ask me questions at the end. Um, this is Ori Inbar. He's a software engineer. Um, and in 2007, he left his IT job to spend some more time with his family. Uh, what he discovered was, like many of today's children, uh, they were spending too much time in technology, uh, playing games, watching screens, surfing the internet. Um, and yeah, not nearly enough time out in nature. Uh, my philosophy is as much time as you spend in technology, you must spend it away from technology. Um, so he wondered, is reality too boring for children? <laughs> How could we engage them more in reality? Um, and if that's the case, what would reality 2.0 look like? Um, <laughs> he believes that we need to take some things that attract them to these digital worlds and bring them into the real world. Uh, so, in a way, augment our world. Uh, so what is augmented reality? It's not that. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, it's To augment is to uh, add to our world in a way that benefits it um, with, with digital content. Um, I'm going to be talking about the visual side of things. Um, there's reasons for that. But we have other senses as well that we can augment, and we've been augmented for a long time. Um, smell of vision is quite a popular one. Uh, watching TV and, and you know, uh, smelling what's going on as well. Uh, audio, we've been augmenting our world of musical instruments, etc., for you know, a very long time. We've got to some pretty smart technology, like this pair of uh, headphones here, uh, which can sense your um, heartbeats and your moods and play music or change things, depending on, you know, keep track of what's going on. But the reason why uh, augmented reality is so focused on the visual is because that's where we get most of the data into our brain, is through our eyes. So depending on the material you read, between 70 and 80% of uh, the data going into our heads is through those, through our eyes. Um, now, without moving your eyes, uh, each eye has approximately eight megapixels um, resolution. It's a bit hard to judge, but, um, and it's estimated that seven of those are in the sort of central few degrees, um, as demonstrated here. Um, interestingly, uh, each eye has a blind spot, which is about 10 degrees out to the side. So if you, if you did the whole movement out here, your thumb disappears at about 10 to 12 degrees. New party trick. So where's augmented reality now? If we go at the, the Gartner hype cycle, we're probably uh, somewhere around there in the trough of disillusionment. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is hardware, and the other one is uh, software design or um, uh, apps, etc. Uh, currently, hardware relies on us to carry our phones, which I've lost, so if anyone finds mine, <laughs> cheers. Um, or an uh, uh, iPad or uh, a webcam on your um, uh, laptop, etc. So it's, it's not very user friendly. Um, eventually, uh, some of these more hardcore devices like this will be coming out. They have to get a bit better looking. <laughs> Don't think too many of us will be walking down the street wearing those. But they've come a, a long way from the huge helmets of, of really not that long ago. Uh, there's some key important things we have to overcome. Wide field of view, so it needs to be above 80 degrees uh, to immerse us in this new digital world. Uh, high resolution, obviously, uh, and a few other little tricks like st stereoscopic vision, etc. Uh, there are some other cool technologies we're working on, or not me personally, but humanity. Uh, retina implants are being used at the moment in conjunction with the external camera. Uh, the camera feeds the, 
the retina implant, which then sends signals through the optic nerve. Uh, we have a very prototype, I think I only tested on rabbits so far, but um, uh, contact lenses. Uh, and although the resolutions improved somewhat from when that picture was taken, it's still very low resolutions, maybe 100 by 100 pixels or 200 by 200 pixels. So not a huge, nowhere near the megapixels that we need to replace our vision. Uh, this is much more interesting. This is Magic Leap. It's very new, it's all hush-hush. It took a lot to find just these images. Um, it's uh, a new startup run by uh, Richard Taylor of Weta Workshop here in New Zealand, plus some other superhumans around, uh, around the world, and they've just received $542 million worth of funding from the likes of Google, etc., um, to fix this hardware issue that we're trying to deal with at the moment. So the way it works is it's a one millimeter by nine millimeter device. It used to be used as a camera to go in and look and, and pull light out, as cameras do but they decided to reverse it and use it as a mini projector. Now, the oscillating uh, optic fiber there moves in a spiral pattern, and as it moves, it's, it's changing its light as it goes, and it can produce, uh, I'll just go back a slide, a, pic a picture much bigger than a, a spot of light from a single um, traditional optic fib uh, fiber. So, uh, it's not hard to imagine something like that just sitting on the side of your glasses there, projecting information straight into your eye. Uh, one on each side, you've got stereoscopic vision, so you can project, uh, make it appear that uh, digital content is far away from you. Um, they can also work on allowing you to focus at different depths and things as well. Uh, but it's all the size of the, this machine currently is a big head robot, but we'll get there. Okay, so that's a little bit about the hardware side of things. I'd like to talk also about AR design, because it's actually really important um, to prevent, prevent disengagement and uh, ensure that augmented reality continues to flourish. So um, these are being proposed by Lex uh, Ardes. Uh, Ardes. Uh, so augmented reality must emerge from the real world and relate to it. Um, I'll come back to these. Uh, enhance reality, not distract us from it, like the, the original picture of the car, um, and must deliver a superior experience uh, to alternatives. Or better yet, there aren't any alternatives. Augmented reality is the, the only way we should or could do it. Um, and for obvious reasons, that's not practical in a lot of situations. So rule one, um, augmented reality must emerge from the real world and relate to it. Um, this describes how content is attached to the real world and, um, uh, and, and it must appear to be connected with it. There's no point having uh, just content hovering in front of you. Uh, it needs to really come out of the real world. Okay, Google Glass. <laughs> so this isn't augmented reality. Um, it's had a lot of hype um, and it's beefed up um, the, the, the story around augmented reality, but it's really not. Um, the problem is, is a small screen off the side of your view, which firstly means you don't get stereoscopic and you can't do depth, but also to actually see the projection of the content, you look up and see another copy of it up to your right hand side, which is basically the camera view. Um, so this is a little bit better, it's still not perfect because we're carrying a device around. Um, but you can position it in front of the object so that you can uh, see the magazine changing and um, uh, make it appear as though the content's attached to the magazine or at least coming from it. Uh, Let's go back step. Rule number two, augmented reality must enhance reality, not distract us from it. So <laughs> there's plenty of ways to escape into the digital world. We're really good at that at the moment. Uh, this device here, the Oculus Rift, if you ever get a chance, have a go. They're great. I should have brought mine along. Um, those of you that have tried it, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and this is just prototype level stuff. So we can escape to 
digital worlds already. We don't need to do that with augmented reality. That's not really the point. Yes, there'll be a bit of crossover, but again, not the point. Uh, rule three, augmented reality must deliver a superior experience to alternatives. Here's the best example of this that I, uh, I could find. Um, this is a fascinating app called World Lens. It translates English to and from six different languages. Uh, and the basis is you turn it on, you hold your phone up to a sign, and it changes with the same font and colour um, the sign to read in whatever language you, you've chosen um, on the fly. Brilliant. Um, you couldn't do this any other way without having to um, make it more cumbersome for the user, and that's the point, trying to make it easier for them. Uh, here's an example of some content that recognises a picture and then overlays just some random text, well not random, it's obviously to do with it, but just some text over the top of um, what you're looking at through, through the device. Um, not overly useful, and perhaps you could do this a better way. For instance, could you not just have a little plaque or a little bit of writing on the side of the, the, the wall there? Um, why would you make your visitors download an app just to get that information, um, especially when not everybody has that? Okay, uh, for augmented reality to work, your device must first uh, recognise and understand what it's looking at, uh, computer vision. There, there are several different techniques. Uh, firstly, 2D tracking. So this is just simple QR code based markers or magazines like we saw earlier. Uh, it can also be done with 3D objects, uh, CAD models or uh, point maps, etc. Uh, point maps are very similar to facial recognition, so there's some points in a 3D space and it, it recognises that exactly the same. Uh, there's also uh, a non-visual tracking um, like GPS. Uh, it works out your position, your orientation and the uh, position orientation of the content and it can tell when you're looking at it and therefore display it on your screen. Uh, a lot of these can be used in conjunction with each other to improve the robustness um, of an experience. Um, one of the additional techniques is using simultaneous localization and mapping, or SLAM. Uh, basically, it builds a 3D point cloud such as this on the fly and combines the other techniques to, to make it quite a, a robust technique. Uh, so let's take a look at a couple more examples. Uh, I know I said, what's the point of covering up a, <laughs> a painting like this? Um, it is slightly better than the other example. Firstly, it's actually attached to it, so you can walk around and, and, and look at it. Secondly, it's adding video and audio and things that are more interesting and that you couldn't just stick on a wall without putting a, say, a TV there. This is one of my all-time favourites, it's a sandpit. So the, the kids play in the sandpit, they mould it, and using a projector, it, it overlays the, the contour lines so they learn about height, etc. They can then uh, put in digital water and watch how the water reacts and moves with, with what they've designed. Uh, artists use it, use it um, either themselves uh, by extending on 2Ds or 3D traditional art, or there's quite a movement for people to come along and add things to other people's content. Uh, classrooms. Having a moving, um, scalable uh, 3D model of a solar system um, or a heart is, for me, just quite invaluable for in the education space. Uh, there's a lot of different companies working on this, and this is probably one of the areas I'm most excited about. Uh, another favourite, <laughs> this is Elements by Daiquiri. Uh, they have six different cubes, different things on each side, and as, as students you can bring them together and create uh, chemistry experience, experiments without the risk of blowing yourself up or the teacher up. Uh, it, it's all animated, it works really well, um, great, uh, and it's free. Um, you, you can buy the blocks, uh, wooden ones, but you can download the, the template for free. And there's some marketing um, uses as well, but that's, that's by the way. 
so what's next for AR? Uh, as global citizens, we've conquered traveling to locations and seeing the world, but what about bringing the world to us? So I approached the Nelson Provincial Museum last year and the Suda Gallery and asked if I could uh, replicate some of the exhibits using uh, 3D technology um, and just photographs. Uh, so this is uh, from the Roman um, exhibition they had um, at the time. I then attached all this content to a blank space um, at our local polytech uh, where users could come in and just have a look at uh, uh, either the Suda Gallery or the museum, just flick between the two. Uh, during that process I learned loads about Nelson's history. I'm not a local Nelson person, but um, there's a lot of great history there. One of the oldest cities, so from 1860s onwards we have the most amazing glass plate um, collection, which I'm sure you all know about. Uh, they just reached their 100,000th um, digitised um, uh, glass plate last week, uh, and half of those are already uplo uploaded online for people to access. Uh, I realise how much of a treasure these photographs are. I mean, this is classic um, 19th century photoshopping to remove this lady's wrinkles. So they sit there with little paintbrushes and whatnot, it's brilliant. I also met the uh, wonderful education team. The museum themselves um, uh, go around the city and show the, the kids these um, and hold them up to see what it used to look like. So we wondered, let's, uh, let's try and replicate that for the masses. So this is Hart. You can go to, I'll just speed through because I'm running out of time. So these are the lovely sponsors and people that helped it out. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so these are the locations around the city. You can go to these locations now uh, with the app, hold it up and you get a representation of what it looked like um, 100 years ago. Uh, we used a different technology that's been used before in Christchurch, etc. Uh, we used something called edge-based mapping. Uh, we build 3D models of the scene and then uh, uh, place them into uh, the app and use SLAM as well to give a really robust non-GPS floating around um, experience for users. Fortunately, it takes a wee while to do, uh, a good day or two to um, make a scene. Uh, but it's, it's worth it to, to have those pictures aligned perfectly. Um, the, I might just finish there and just see if there's any quick questions actually. Cool. Anyone? Yeah, yeah, awesome marketing. They've done they've done similar sort of things before. Cool. Um, thank you very much, and a warm round of applause for David. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I no, no, no worries.